is up, everybody. Welcome to another episode of the Hookshots Podcast. I am your host, Joe Cermelli, inviting you today to throw on an old pair of dungarees and stick a little walking around money in your pocket. Because today, my friends, we are going to do some dickering. We are going to do some junking. How does that sound? Now, for any of you guys who follow us on Facebook, you might already know that um, I kind of have a Jones for old tackle, vintage tackle. It's like a thing that I'm very into. And this the office that I'm sitting in right now at HSHQ is covered in the shit. I mean, just shelves full of old reels and old advertisements hanging up in here and old flies and pegboards full of old lures, um, all purchased well against my wife's behest because nothing that I own is any sort of like investment, right? It's essentially, um, it's essentially junk. I just think that it's, that it's neat. And actually, um, while I do like to buy some things for display purposes, what I'm, what I'm really into is like old quality gear, uh, a lot of which I still fish. So based on response to everything vintagey that I post on Facebook, I, I think that a lot of you guys out there are, are with me on the the flea market scene, okay, the antique store scene. Truth be told, I think my second favorite hobby uh, next to fishing is going to such places and rummaging for old fishing gear, right? And, you know, I have a running list of things that, like, are, like, my dream finds, but most of the time what I buy is just something that I think is neat. Now, maybe you're not into this at all. You're like, ew, flea market? That's disgusting. I'll just go buy a new reel at Dick's Sporting Goods, and uh, I think flea markets are gross. Fine, that's cool. But the guy we're going to be talking to today is an acquaintance of mine named Mike Calafoot. And this dude, for like 35 years, has been in the vintage tackle business. There's nobody I could think of that is is more just ingrained in it and knowledgeable about it. And that's who we're going to be talking about today. And a lot of things that he has to say about old tackle, including you know the things to buy if you see them. And how tackle was made back in the day versus how it's made now is really fascinating. And it inadvertently painted uh, sort of a picture of where the tackle industry has gone that I wasn't really even expecting to uncover with this. But it did. So even if you have never uh, had the pleasure of rifling through somebody else's boxes of old shit, okay, stick with us. Now in the hierarchy of junking, okay, let's break this down a little bit. Garage sales are the best, okay, because people at garage sales are genuinely trying to make room in their home, therefore they will haggle and dicker and sell stuff cheap because they just want to get rid of it, okay, so garage sales are good, not that I go to that many, I kind of do the drive-by street browse and maybe if I see a a rod or two sticking up, Um, but I, I don't do that many garage sales, I should do more. Um, estate sales, I don't know. That's like a whole other world. I've, I've not really dabbled there. Flea markets can be great, okay? Um, people people want to dicker at the flea market. So you, you, can, you can find some good deals on some quality vintage tackle at the flea market. But really, and, and Mike will certainly back this up, that's changing thanks to American pickers. I mean, the truth these days uh, is that everybody either knows exactly what they have or they just think that it's worth a whole shitload more money than it actually is and put ridiculous prices on it. I have a flea market up the street here. I've been going to it since I was a little kid with my grandparents. Uh, the Golden Nugget in Lambertville, New Jersey. Awesome stuff. Some of the coolest stuff you will find there. But, like, a dude will have a Poland Springs water bottle on the table. He'll want 50 bucks for it because, like, it's from 1975. It's like, well, dude, no, it's still it's still f***ing garbage. You know, so it's harder to bump into those deals in those places. Now, antique stores, right? I mean, I will hit some antique stores, and and my wife comes with me, and they're cool. Like, it's a lot of fun, and I've bought some cool things at antique stores, but they're really not, like, totally my preference because they're, the, they're the, like, the, the worst case of people knowing what they have. Like, the odds of you finding something you really want at like a stupid price because the people in the store don't know what the hell it is, pretty slim. I've definitely learned that over the years. And I don't know, for me, there's something that's it's not as fun 
Um, you know, when like you have a nice store, it's all set up, like everything's nice and organized. And oh, look at this case over here it has some reels in it and things, dude. No, like I, I want to be dirty. You know what I mean? Like I want to have to like dig through old tackle boxes. I want to have to dig through boxes because there might be some Orvis reel buried under all this crap. You know what I mean? I want to accidentally run my fingers across the razor blade in an old paint scraper and possibly get tetanus because there might be a damn quick spinning reel at the bottom of that laundry basket. That is what I'm about. That's real junkin. And, you know, you don't get the opportunity to do it that much anymore. Antique shops, real easy. A real junkin scenario, not so much. But to that point, not long ago, a couple months ago, old high school buddy of mine messages me on Facebook with a link to uh, something on Facebook Marketplace, and he's like, this seems like it's right up your alley. And I open it, and it's a guy who lives not too far from me, and he's he's moving, and he's selling all this fishing gear. He's got all these pictures of his garage, and there's lures hanging all over, and tackle boxes stacked, and rods. And I messaged the guy, and I was like, what the hell? Like, I'd like to come look at this stuff. He's like, ah, come over on Saturday, you know, come check it out. And I'm looking at these pictures, and, and if I'm being real honest, nothing in the pictures jumped out at me as something that I needed to have. But I'm thinking, like, well, what am I not seeing? You know what I mean? What are the things this dude's got that I'm not seeing? So my buddy Alan and I took the drive over together because safety in numbers. I don't just show up at a random dude's house alone. I've never done this before. And we get there, and there's, like, three cars in the driveway. And instantly I was like, ah, damn it. Like, you know, it's not like I'm getting, like, the free pass to swing by. Like, this is like a revolving door today because of this this Facebook post. And to make a long story short, um, the gear that the guy had was um, just as beat up and shitty as it was in the photos. I pretty much instantly regretted taking the drive as soon as I got into this garage, and the most bizarre part about it was there were a couple other dudes there, and they were behaving as though we were in competition for these wonderful fishing wares in this house, to the point where like, I tried to be like, hey, what's up, man? You know, these guys wouldn't even talk to me. And they're, they're asking for prices on whole tackle boxes without even looking at them out of, like, what I perceived as fear that, like, me and my buddy Alan were going to scoop that. We're going to scoop that shit before this guy got it. And meanwhile, like, I'm looking through these tackle boxes, and there's, like, you know, some helicopter lures, a couple of Snoopy bobbers, like, half open packs of snelled hooks, like, clearly some Uncle Josh pork rind juice spilled in the bottom, and, like, you know, a couple of, of prepackaged fluke rigs. And I'm like, why is this dude fighting over this stuff. Anyway, look, I'm not knocking that. I mean, somebody probably has use for those helicopter lures, but I'm in the game more for novelty, cool things that I can either hang up in La Officina or some some quality old stuff that I can fish. Now, as I had mentioned, I always have like a little running list of sort of dream finds that I always have an eye out for when I'm out there junking, right? And one of those things was a Penn International fly reel, gold pen fly reel. They did not make them for many years, and I always wanted one. Now, could I go on eBay any given day and buy that? Yes, I could. But that is not fun, okay? The fun is bumping into it somewhere. It's finding it on your own. And I had never bumped into a Penn International fly reel anywhere. And here's where, where, where Mike Califoot's going to come in. Okay. So years ago, uh, my buddy, Mark Wiseman, best man at my wedding, I'm shouting him out because I know he listens. Uh, he got married in Harrisburg, Pennsylvania. So the missus and I are driving out on the PA turnpike and there's a huge sign for this big antiques joint in Adamstown, PA, halfway there. And I was like, Ooh, can we, can we, can we? She's like, Nope, Nope. We do not have time for that right now. But if you're good at this wedding, if you behave at this wedding like an upstanding human being, we'll stop on the way home. So wedding ends, we're driving home, and I'm just like chomping at the bit. I'm like, cool, big antique store. Like, I'm, I'm very excited. And the place is called the German Trading Post and Antiques. And there's actually a whole bunch of antique stores in Adamstown, but the German Trading Post just happened to be the first one that we stop at. And I literally walk through the door, 
and I turn the corner into the first room. This place has tons of rooms. And all I see is row after row, case after case of vintage tackle. And literally staring me in the face right there is every size gold pen international fly reel that was ever made. And my wife was just instantly like, oh, fuck me. Like she knew. Like I was having like heart palpitations. I was completely losing my shit. And she knew that we were not walking out of there without me spending a few hundred dollars. And she looked at me and she was like, you got 300 bucks. You got one thing. See you later. And she went to the other parts of the store to look at the non-fishing things, of which there were not many. Well, lo and behold, all the fishing equipment belonged to Mike Calafoot. Um, that you know he was one of the one of the, the the dealers there, and he happened to be there. So we started talking, and you know he fishes big time, fly guy, uh, salmon, steelhead, particularly uh, what he's fond of. And we ended up striking a deal on the international. You know he helped me out. And I kid you not, barring one item on my my dream wish list, which we'll talk about with Mike, he had every single thing that I ever wanted to find at a flea market, antique store, or junk in somewhere in one place. All of them. He had absolutely all of them. And I, I don't even need to rattle them all off, okay? But they were all there. I, I mean, it, it was just like mind-numbing. Like I was, like I was getting dizzy in this store. And uh, I was so fascinated by everything there that we we talked for a good long while. I mean, it was obvious that he was incredibly knowledgeable and like Vintage Tackle was his business. And I, I actually ended up writing a blog post about it that they printed next time I was in there, they printed it and put it on foam core and it's it's actually hanging in that store. Um, and I've, I've bought a couple other things from Mike since I've been out there, although my dream list things, a couple got sold, you know, a couple of these, these are not cheap items. So, um, you know, I, I, I didn't like swoop in and buy them all, but more about that later. In any case, it was just a mind blowing experience. So the reason I thought it'd be interesting to talk to Mike is not to get a picture of sort of like the most rare vintage tackle finds that there ever were. Okay. We're not talking about things you might bump into that are worth you know, ten, fifteen, thirty thousand dollars. But if you do peruse fishing gear at flea markets and things like that, you know, you start to see patterns. There's like a lot of brands out there that are very commonplace. You see tons of them in all categories, rods, reels, um, lures especially. So what I wanted to know from Mike were sort of like what are some of the more uncommon common finds? And in other words, you know, just to give an example, it's like you might see um, you know, a hundred jitterbug lures at flea markets in a given year if you're out there messing around. But is there one jitterbug that was more rare, uh, you know, a color that they didn't make very long, that it's like, hey, you know, this is not something that's going to cost you a ton of money, you know, but if you see that one, grab that one. So that was my initial goal with Mike was to just – sort of give the vintage tackle freaks such as myself, the flea marketers, you know, maybe like a short list of, of little things that you should keep an eye out for, but are also not that uncommon to find. And not only did Mike give me that, you know, he also is just so knowledgeable about all this stuff that he had some really insightful things to say about like which old rods and reels that you'll see, even if they're not that rare, are worth buying because they're good quality rods and reels. In some cases, in his opinion, better than the stuff that you can buy today. So if you pick, you will walk away from this conversation more prepared to pick. And if you do not pick, I still promise there's something you will pick out of this conversation that will make you go, hmm, damn, never thought about that before. Try it, won't pick it up, take them like the way. Try it, won't pick it up, don't take your life away. Hello. Hey, Mike. How goes it, man? Good, bud. Can you hear me okay? Yeah, I can hear you fine. Yeah. Most excellent, man. You sound you sound good, too. So um, we didn't catch up earlier this week because you had some uh, auctions and some picking to do. Any any killer finds this week? Um, 
not really in the fishing tackle, but I had some. Yeah, like recently I bought a a, a couple of nice uh, pieces, uh, mostly high end stuff. But uh, yeah, it's it's you know it's hit or miss. I I was hoping to make it to. I missed the uh, Gettysburg NFL CC show, but oh. uh, other than that, yeah, I was up at the um the Edison fly fishing show where I picked up a couple nice things. Yeah, I mean, there's no deals there, though. We both know that. I was at that show, too. <laughs> you were? <laughs> yeah, you pay. You yeah, pay. it seems it's more commercial now. I'm right now, as we speak, I'm at the Harrisburg Greater Outdoor Sportsman Show. Oh, wow. That's a big one, man. I'm in the lobby. Yes, and it's, it's huge. It's yeah, humongous. Yeah. Well, I recommend it. It's, it's, it's got, it, there's some good deals here. It's funny you brought up the Edison Fly Show, and not to rag on the Fly Show, but what I used to love about it when I was a kid was that, like, it had a little bit of that flea market kind of vibe, right? There were dudes, like, oh, yeah. selling cheap tools and cheap reels and all this stuff. And they've, they've gotten yep. away from that, and now it's like, I don't know, it's very, it's very commercial. It's all outfitters, and, and yeah, it, it, this show is the same. It's all outfitters and uh, manufacturers, you know. Most of it, you know, what I'm saying, you know, if you want to, I was just looking at somebody. What you want to spend twenty five thousand to to uh, hunt black, uh, you know, grizzly in, in Alaska? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know, yeah. some and, and 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 like you said, I I agree with you. I've been going to the uh, New Jersey show in the summer when it was at Somerset uh, for at least twenty twenty five years. Right. Since he started it, Ferminsky, I think I was probably there in the first couple of years. Right. And you were right. It was good flea market stuff, a lot of vintage stuff, and uh, just a lot of people like that. And it's everything got priced out. People can afford, can't afford to uh, set up these shows. Yeah, I you mean, for, for me, you'd have bins and bins of material. It was like anything in this bin was 50 cents. Oh, yeah, cents. fly tying stuff. Yep. Like, dude, that's it. what yeah. I went to the damn show for, you know? Mm-hmm. But yep. I don't know, we are, we are kindred, kindred spirits in our... Uh, Desire to rummage through things and and find the gem. Um, so I yeah. mean, dude, we've we've met a couple of times, but you know, I, I kind of need a little backstory, Mike. Like, how long have you been in the vintage tackle game? Like, you know, when when did you start oh, doing this? I started collecting thirty thirty five years ago. Okay, and all through the time while I was working, I went to show. I used to go before eBay. There was only a few places you could go, and. Uh, you know, I used to go to the shows in New Jersey. I'm talking like the shows in Brick and right. a couple other places. Right. And they were shows that you could go and get good vintage tackle and good stuff. You know what I mean? And I went to the firehouse show and all that other stuff. Yeah. Well, along came eBay in 98, which kind of made it, it made it like all year long, but it also, uh, it, it affects people like the internet is doing to the people here. You just can't afford to compete with it anymore. Sure. So sure. Yeah. So that made it a whole different ball game. Well, eBay but, uh, eBay was really neat when it first came out, but I don't know. To me, the fun has always been finding the something in person. Exactly. You know, exactly. it takes the fun and away. It down. Yeah, exactly. Yep. It takes something away if you're finding junk on Craigslist. Not that I don't ever do it, but I mean, it, it has to be something that I really want. But and, and I don't know if in other parts of the country they have fishing flea markets like we have here. But for anybody listening who doesn't know, like in the winter, what Mike and I are talking about, you have these small local fishing clubs. They do flea markets at the firehouse, at the high school. And Absolutely. Same thing. Back in the day, man, that's where you would go to buy a bag of cheap jig heads and rummage through people's old stuff. There's no deals with them anymore either, man. Everybody knows what they what they've got, you know. Yep. And uh, not only that, it's not only that. It's a lot of people hawking new product too, right? You know, so it's not like you're going out to. That's what it is here too. A lot of a lot of people here. There's, there's absolutely no vintage people, shell, you know, putting out stuff, new stuff, and 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 that's again, they're trying to sell new product as cheap as possible, and you're competing against. You know, fifty other guys. You know, trying to sell the same. Thing. <laughs> right. You know, right. so it's sure. difficult. It, sure. But, well, uh, I mean, you're so wrapped up in the whole antique world, not just fishing stuff. I mean, do you think that shows like American Pickers and things have sort of ruined the charm of that because people want to haggle more, or they think they know what they have more than they ever did before? I think it, it affected the pricing of it because American Pickers is a lot of staged. Uh, deals. Sure. When I say staged, they do things, and at the end of the day, it never is like it was. I'll tell you what, in one of their shows, they found a, a, a Spider-Man 1. Right, and I remember that. I yeah. lived, 
I, I live near Hake Auctions. It's in New York. And I heard that Hake loaned that. Really? And they put it in the show. Yeah, it was, you know, like I said, there's a lot of things people do in that show. It's funny because, you know what, you mentioned it, you know, you walk into a room full of good stuff, and the guys from Pickers are pointing to stuff, and you're looking over the shoulder of the guy, and you think, wow, man, why aren't they going after this? Or why aren't they going after that? I see it all the time. And, exactly. And then, you know what the bad part of it is, too? Think about this. You might think, oh, I know where that place is. And you might go up there, and people go up there and bother the people and say, hey, would you like to sell the other things that you didn't sell? Right. You know? Right. So I can imagine what it is for the people who are on the show, what a nightmare it must be from people following up and trying to get back, you know, oh, trying I, to pick their stuff afterwards, you know? I, I mean, I've seen it, too. I mean, really, the only vintage stuff I'm interested in is fishing gear, and I watch that show, and... I agree, man. I'll see some skin mount or some, you know, like there'll be a bunch of rods in a corner and they don't ever even look at that. And all I'm thinking is like, God, no, man, I want to go. They don't really mess you know? with it. No. You, you know what? Antiques Roadshow, where I always, I applied to be on that show and I wanted to bring some of my nicer, like Baumhoff and Zwarg and right. Murphy and stuff. Never was, you know, never, they never got back to me. But I said, you know, why did, I've never seen, I mean, I've seen everything, sport memorabilia, toys, other stuff, jewelry. I've never seen them do a show where they showed any significant fishing tack. Right. You know what I'm saying? Right. Never never anything good, you know? Right. Well and you Weird. you bring up Von Humpf and you know, again for the for the unacquainted Von Humpf, that was a real maker from the early nineteen hundreds, if I'm not mistaken, and like right. super high end stuff. And dude, you mm-hmm. you'll want to smack me for this, but the only one that I've ever bumped into was in an antique store, and it was encased in resin because somebody used it to make a nautical themed lamp, and oh. I didn't buy it. It was like it was like a hundred bucks for the lamp, and I figured oh. I'll never get this real cleaned up. It's all resin in place. There was a rod coming up to the lampshade, and I didn't buy it. And I went back a week later, and it was gone, which is proof of the lesson on American pickers, right? That you 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 buy it when you see it, right? You know, they're tight. Mar- they're, you know what? And and this is something from being around it and having, you know, the the Lauren stuff. You do better as far as resell. When you buy those couple thousand dollar reels, normally you're not making it, but a couple hundred dollars. It's such a tight market, right? And and I, and I've been doing it since when I first started collecting bomb hops. I didn't pay over eight hundred dollars for a reel. And this is in the early nineties. Wow. Now. And now any 423, the small ones, forget it. But any 423 now, look at eBay. They're, they're 2,800, 3,000. Yeah. I mean, the prices are ridiculous. Yeah. And they're one of the few items that, you know, everything took a downturn in 2008. The, the, the Baumhoff market stayed strong. Yeah. It was, it was, you know, the higher end real stayed strong in that time. Sure. It's just that it was with good, good stuff holds its value yeah um for me i'd like you know we we were talking with before when you were talking about doing this you said uh you know can you talk about some of the you know lower end stuff that people can start out and collecting and i i was looking at and i'll send you some pictures of martin reels uh-huh martin sure. did a lot of trade reels and you know what trade reels are they manufactured them and, and made them for like jc higgins uh right i have one western auto and all these other companies but it's fun trying to find all the Martin trade reels. And there are probably, you know, 50 of them. I don't know all the companies they made them for. And the great thing about it is they're made in the United States. They're still making them today. And they're sturdy reels. Yeah. They're very sturdy reels, you know? Yeah. So, the, so these are like the old school style, like Click Paul, which, I mean, they are kind of a, yeah. a dime a dozen Martin reels. Single are, action, yeah. Right, right. I mean, I, I bump into Martin reels at junk shops and flea markets all the time but i mean you do make a good point like if you're you know mike and i aren't doing this um you know so that you guys can go out there to a flea market and look for something that's worth ten thousand dollars not that that you know that not to say that couldn't happen but really there's a lot of sort of um what we were going for were the uncommon common finds and that's a great example like martin reels are a dime a dozen but these trade reels that mike's talking about it's like you know, look for those. If those are the ones you can mm. find, those are the ones worth picking up. And if you're into vintage tackle, a lot of those old reels, man, they still function like they're perfectly fishable, especially for trout or something mm. like that. Yep. 
you know. Exactly. But and the other thing is when you're when you're you're looking. I I was you know looking at some of the lures I have now. They come and go, but a lot of big lure manufacturers, Paul Paul, and all those other companies, right. they did the same thing. They made lures for other people, and and a Paul Paul lures again like a common lure, you know. But you can look for Paul Paul made them for. They made them for Higgins. They made them for a lot of people, J.C. Higgins. And I can remember, not my time, but before Sears, I have a J.C. Higgins in the box that has a Sears price tag on it. Right. But before uh, Ted Williams Game Getter, what, there was J.C. Higgins was the, was the brand that sold out of Sears and Roebuck. Right. So, yeah, I mean, there's, and, and Ted, that's another, Ted Williams reels are fun to collect. Right. I mean, they, 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 Ted Williams had made at least, I mean, put his name on at least a half a dozen reels for Sears. One of the best are the, the Italian ones made by Alcido. He also had uh, reels that were less expensive that were made in Japan and stuff. But they, you know, I'm saying that the Ted Williams brand was a good brand of reels. Right. You know, so, but they, you know, again, I'm, I'm, what I was doing, I used to buy everything. That's my whole thing. Anything like had to do with fishing, uh, artwork, uh, rods, reels, you name it. Yeah. If it had, if it had to do with fishing, I'm buying it. You know, so that's, that's the way I was. Was there one category though in your early days, Mike, that you started out collecting like one particular type of tackle that really you were attracted to? Atlantic County tackle. Like ah, the Bob Hoff. Right. And European. I, but you know what? I took a, I, I took a hit on European stuff. Because I was buying European stuff when the the pound or the uh, euro was a dollar fifty to a dollar. Okay, there was no parity, and I was buying stuff out of European auction houses and paying you know, one and a half times plus the shipping, which was ridiculous. Right. So on top of all that, but I had a nice collection of Dingleys and Walker Bamptons, Hardy reels, you know. I'm still selling. I have, you know, I still have a good collection of them left. Yeah. But they're not more than what I paid for them. <laughs> right, <laughs> right, yeah, right. I mean, I paid a little bit for them too much. The two years, I mean, uh, probably in the late 90s. Right, right. So obviously you've spent a lot of time at auctions, but I mean, you know, how much digging do you do? Like, what's the what's the most notable piece of tackle you ever found, like, completely random at a garage sale or, you know, that you got cheap that maybe the person didn't know exactly what they had? Uh, I would say I bought from a friend a reel that I didn't even know what it was worth. It was a Silex multiplier. Okay. And there's two, two and three eight size in its case. Um, I wound up selling it for five times what I paid for it. The guy offered me, I, I, there was a guy in Canada and they call him Mr. Hardy. And this guy is like, the, 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 you know, he knows everything about Hardy Reels A to Z. Right. And this thing was in absolute mint condition. And I sold it to him for, I think, $3,500. Wow. Wow. And I think I paid like, I think I paid like only like four or 500. Right. Which I thought was a lot. I thought, I thought I was paying too much for it, but somebody threw the number at me and said, here, I'll, you know, he, he he offered. I didn't say I want this much. He said I'll give you this much. Sure. So that was a that was a big. But I've had other you know deals on stuff that I found rods especially. I just bought two Nat Uslin five sided spinning rods. Okay. They were seven foot, and Nat Uslin was known for five sided bamboo, and he made them for Airex. Okay. They were called rainbows. I bought two of them for forty dollars. Wow, there's one on, there's one on eBay for eight hundred. <laughs> right. I put mines. I, I listed mines for. I think I listed them for two hundred and a hundred and a quarter because one has a repair. So <laughs> I was like, Yeah, you know, I can't. I'm not going to sit there and take all the juice out of the orange either. Yeah, that's what a lot of people do. You know, sure. They get, sure. They get it for they get it for five dollars and they want five thousand. Right. I don't. I don't go. I don't go like that. Right. But I try to. I try to make it so. The next guy has a little value left in it, you know? So, I mean, uh, you know, you obviously there, there are guys out there who want the high-end stuff that you are very familiar with. But, like, what do you see on average for sort of the peripheral vintage guy? I mean, you know, what's the average spend on an old, you know, an old reel? What do guys want to pay? 
Well, it depends. Like you were saying about the usability of the Martin reel, some people like, yeah, they'll spend, you know, 10, 15, 20 dollars on a reel that they're going to fish with trout. The other thing is it's something you're not going to use. It's in like a shelf reel. Right. They could spend hundreds of dollars. If right. it's something they really, really want. See, I got people coming into the shop. And you've seen how many reels I have there. Oh, yeah. I have people coming in at the bottom, like they want to start out with a with a Martin type reel and spend ten to fifteen dollars. Right. Other people come in and I could tell by just looking at their face. They look around and they, they, they walk out because they're not seeing what they want. And they want the high end things. So I try to cater to all people, try to give everybody a little bit of what they want. So when people ask me, Do you have this? You know, I say, yeah, maybe I, I got to look through my stuff. Right. You know, but uh, you know, it, it's it's hard to explain. Sure, like no. those pen reel, the pen reel that you bought for me. Yeah. I bought I bought three or four of them brand new when they were still being made over here in Soderton. This was years ago, and I knew the guy who did the um, field testing for the reel. Okay. They were great reels. They were absolutely. I don't, the only reason that Penn stopped producing them, the cost of manufacturing was ridiculous. Right. They were not, they were not getting them. If they had to sell them today, they would be $800, $900. Sure. Sure. They'd be right up there. They'd be right up there with an able. Yeah. You know, they'd be right, you know, you know how they're, they're just oiled cork drags and the same design as an able reel. Yeah. Oh, but yeah. They only were, they were only in production for maybe. I would say no more than three or four years. They, well, weren't, they weren't out there very long. That's a classic example of a thing that I had seen old advertisements for in old saltwater sportsmen's, and just being a, a, a fan of Penn stuff, I always thought that it would be neat to have one of those internationals, and that's how we met. I walked into the store up there, and there were three of them staring me in the face, but – you know, I I bought that to fish it. I fished that reel. I've since gotten my hands on one of the smaller ones, and I fished that yeah. one too. Just because I I don't know. I I just have this weird thing. I get off on that. I like tackle with miles on it. I like older tackle. I like to fish it. But you know, how many guys are coming into the store that uh, you know genuinely are, are are interested in fishing old stuff? Like they like they really truly just want an old reel, not because they can't afford a new one. But, you know, they think it's neat to fish with that stuff. I just had a guy, funny you should say that, a guy came in and he showed me pictures of king salmon that he caught in New York. Okay. Giant. I'm talking almost 35 to 40 pounders. And these things are huge. And he, and he said, he goes, I want, he broke a bamboo rod. He goes, I want a bamboo, vintage bamboo rod, a vintage reel. Well, I showed him, I said, I have a hardy, um, Palantona come by, and that you know is uh, twelve and a half foot uh, steel. It's it's got a steel rod in the in the bottom of it. Right. And I also showed him Hardy. Um, well, I have a modern Casapedia, but I I said I recommended. I said if you could use the rod. I said I have these heavy uh, older reels, but you know I would recommend a modern reel with better better drag on it. But yeah, he's he's you know figuring to come in and spend a thousand dollars on it. The combo. Wow! So he was he was fishing bamboo, and he liked it so much that he wanted to stick with it and was willing to pay up for it. He wanted to do that. He wanted to exactly what you just said. He wanted to fish vintage stuff and catch big fish. There's people who do it in Canada all the time. I've seen people fishing uh, model perfect salmon reels right. and bamboo rods. Yeah, right. I mean, there's people you know. There are clubs throughout the country that exist for that kind of thing, too, in all different genres. Like, I believe there's some bass clubs in Florida that that's what they do. They get together and fish old bass rods and reels and line oh, yeah. and, and lures. Yep. Yep. That's that's part of it. You know what I mean? And the stuff you hear from years ago works great. I mean, it's all, you know, awesome stuff. I like, personally, I fish glass, right? So I like fiberglass fly rods. Right. Because they call it poor man's bamboo. Because they have such nice feel and so forgiving and casting and stuff, but they feel great when you're landing a 10 inch or a 12 inch trout. It just puts a nice bend in the rod. Sure. I sure. mean, high, mod high modulus graphite, when I first started fly fishing, it's not easy to fish in a stream that's 15 foot wide with a nine foot, uh, five foot high modulus graphite because the thing just doesn't load right. It doesn't, you know, it doesn't bend properly and you'll snap like, 
six and seven X off like nobody's business. Right, right. The rod's the rod's just too stiff, too powerful. You know, for that setup. But eh. well, these you know, days. I mean, these days, glasses come back, right? Like, glasses made a, a huge oh, resurgence. Time. So, you know, uh, from from your experience, like, what are some of the more common uh, glass rods out there worth picking up? And not just fly, like conventional, too. Like, I know, um, I remember it was a big deal a couple years ago when Fenwick reintroduced the Fen glass. Um, yeah. So, you know, what are, the, what are some of the ones that people will see a lot of that are worth getting, in your opinion? Well, like you just said, the Fenwick's, are worth and with from say seventy like the late seventies uh, late sixties that's worth gra- uh, grabbing the um the ones that I like personally were the Philipson glass okay they were made they Philipson made glass rods for a lot of different companies they made them for uh, Orvis they made Golden Eagle and you know what. I remember years ago, you couldn't give a golden eagle away. Now, trying to see what they go for. Right. They're, 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 they have all glass rods have gone up big time. And the ones like uh, the hollow wall glass Shakespeare's, you know, you told me about the gat about Gattis that you own. Yeah. I mean, those are, those are, those are rods that, um, in the right weight and stuff, they're great. Like they the presidential series of Shakespeare glass rods, which I think is really, really nice. Uh, fiberglass rod for fishing. Yeah. And you can snatch, and you can snatch one in decent condition for less than a hundred dollars. Now go out and try to buy like Echo. Yeah. Or, uh, You're right. Or one of those other companies, you know, Scott, for, you'll pay a fortune sure. for a glass rod. Sure. You well, can get a nice glass rod, good taper for under a hundred bucks. Right. You know, and that's for fishing. Well, you, you bring a lot of people are redoing them. Yeah, like a lot of people are buying them, stripping them down, and re- redoing them. And then there's—I hate to say it—but there's good glass blanks coming out of uh, Asia too. Real good E glass and S glass. Right. That's really the really right. nice, really well, nice blanks. You you brought up that rod that I have. We talked a little bit about that uh, when we I talked to you before. So it's a Shakespeare Wonder rod. And um, funny story: a friend of mine bought one for like a couple bucks at a flea market in Arizona. My friend Tim Romano. And he just thought it was a neat looking short little fly rod and it was this seafoam green blank. And then, uh, he, he took it home and he put it on the roof of his car at the airport while he was packing his car and drove away and off came the rod. So I stumble across the same rod, uh, a few months later at a flea market for another five bucks or something. And it turned out a, a friend of ours, uh, I don't know if you know, Dr. Uh, Dr. Todd Larson from, um, Whitefish Press. He's another guy that you know knows his vintage stuff. I said, "Hey man, take a look at this. What do you think?" He's like, "Well, Wonder Rods are a dime a dozen, man." But like he said, there was something <laughs> about that seafoam green color that was like the most coveted one, and I, I had no idea that that was the case. Um, yeah. But the rod that I have doesn't say anything about Gad about Gaddis on it. I looked at it. It's just a standard uh, Wonder Rod. Well, you know, in in seafoam green. Well, the one that I was thinking of that you know. It, it, it is rare, and it's the one, the Flying Fisherman was a show in the, uh, I want to say the mid-60s, late, you know, early 60s, and it right. was uh, Kirk Gowdy and Gadabout Gaddis, and they, it's, and Shakespeare made a rod uh, for him, to remember, and believe me, they are scarce. They are scarce rods. I mean, like you said, you know, the, the Wonder Rods, there, there's so many of them. Um, and so many different, um, uh, I mean, uh, so many different lengths and weights out there that, you know, it, you know, there's literally hundreds and hundreds of them. So, right. you know, it, it, to find that one rod it is, uh, I've never yeah. owned one. <laughs> Put it yeah. this way. I had an op, I had a shot at one years ago and didn't get it, but, uh, yeah, they're, they're, they're pretty scarce. Believe me. Right. Well, for, for the non fly guys, Mike, like, um, what about in the spinning reels category? You know, I see a ton of old beater spinning reels at flea markets and garage sales and things. And same thing. I mean, you know, you see a ton of Mitchells. You know, is there um, a, a fairly common one uh, that, that, you know, wouldn't – that well, somebody should grab that's, you know, worth 300 it? Mitchells are, are – they they're a, that's the most common. Um, they made thousands of them. And right. Ones that you want are the ones that are made in France. Okay, they did move move production to China, like every other thing out there. 
but there are certain 300 series, like, um, I think the numbers denote right or left hand, like the 301, 302. Right. And, uh, the, the lefties are, uh, rarer than the right hands. I'd uh, say one in 10 is left. And the one, the, the one reel that's, um, hard to find really, really, ex- you know, goes on the more expensive side is the one that, that has like a fourth that was, uh, used for true temper made a real a rod proprietary with this mitchell reel and oh, you, so you, the, you, the real really, foot the foot is forked it's forked and it's the only way you could use it is on the mitch and on the on the true temper. Ah, i see rod so yeah it's it, it's kind of worthless but it's a collector piece right as far as mitchell mitchell reels are concerned uh there's a lot out there the the, the bigger ones for um surf fishing and whatnot but in the last in, in the, maybe in the last 10 years the prices have gone down substantially sure, sure. yeah they're usually pretty yeah. cheap when you see them now see now just i'm curious what makes a french mitchell 300 better than you know a, a chinese mitchell 300 well the, the, i think everything about it is better um i would say this there's a phosphor bronze gears for one thing right you know the main shaft is probably you know, stainless steel. Uh, they're they're all well made, and the uh, I don't. Know, I think one of the things that's uh, missing on all spinning reels today is the click, the wind click. Yeah, yeah, and, yeah. And, yeah. You know, somebody told me that to put that option into a reel costs like ten or twenty dollars per reel, manufacturing really? cost. Yeah. So if you're talking about these reels, uh, are fifteen twenty dollars. They're going to cost forty, forty dollars because they have a click. Not many reels today. I don't think any ones that are manufactured in you know no. Asia and stuff, yeah, and, and bulk produced, you know, the plastic reels and whatnot. Right. No, they're not. They don't have that click. It's and, missing. And no, and and I know exactly what you mean because for a while, like in my hardcore surf days, I was all ate up. You know, everybody was buying up used pen greenies. You know, when the the seven hundred four and seven ten series were still green and they have that click and they have a, a slow rate of pickup which was great for plugging but i think what people forget it's kind of like old cars you know like i don't know for me man nowadays if i take a modern reel apart to try and fix something half the time i can't get the shit back together again like there's always yeah. one part that i don't know what to do with but the simplicity right. of those old mitchells and old pens is why they're so coveted to a lot of guys because if you get sand in them or you get salt water in them there's like there's like three mm-hmm. pieces in there, man. You could take it apart easily and clean it up. Um, so I know that there's a a lot of benefit there. Now, likewise, you know, uh, with pens in particular, I mean, pen senators and squitters and all that stuff, dime a dozen. Yep. You just see tons and tons of it. What are the gems in the pen series? I know I heard there was one from the 30s that was like gold plated or something like that. Well, they, they did make limited edition. But one thing about pen that you have to realize, you just said it about the simplicity of, you know, taking it apart and putting it back together. I collect American-made pens of any vintage going back to as early as I can get them because I have bags of parts, and parts are interchangeable. It's the most easily repaired reel. If you brought a, like, there's no more reel smiths out there. Right. Years ago, we used to take your fishing uh, reel and get it repaired, lubed, and ready for season, you know. Absolutely. The, the guy would have boxes full of parts for every reel. Nowadays, I have people coming into my shop and handing me a plastic reel that they paid $15 for and asking me, what, you know, can you fix this? And I tell them, I say, listen, for one thing, I don't have the parts. For another thing, you couldn't pay a person. What do you pay me an hour to fix your reel that costs $15 at Walmart? Right. It's just thrown away. It's like a television set nowadays. Yeah. Nobody gets them repaired. You throw them away. No. But that's the thing about pen. Pen reels, American pen reels, are very repairable. They're very repairable. One of the easiest to repair and one of the easiest to, you know, maintain. 
keep it keep it in working order. Sure. And funny story tied to that, man. When I bought that international fly reel off you, the first time I took it out, I dropped it and I cracked the little wood sleeve on the handle and I was like, oh God, like I'll never replace that. There is still one bait shop at the Jersey Shore, Scott's Bait and Tackle. It's like the last holdout that stocks pen parts going back decades. And don't you know, nice. that dude had five of those handles. I couldn't believe it. And he wouldn't, nice. he wouldn't let nice. me, he wouldn't let me buy them all because I wanted to, nice. which I understand. But you're right. I mean, that's, that's part of, 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 of the tackle business today. I mean, just getting a real repair yeah. is such a chore. It is such right. a chore. And they're, pay- and they're, and they're dying off. The, the mom and pop shops like that that do that kind of service are dying off. It's, yeah. You know, if a shop is like, uh, I'll give you an example. I go up and fish Erie for steelhead, uh-huh. but you go through, you, everybody around there is just selling new product and the big box stores, you know what I mean? Like Gander Mountain and whoever, I think they turned into Field Stream and all these other places all selling new product. There's nothing in there to get repaired and uh, it's all Asian, mostly 99% Asian. So it's, you know, buy it, use it, throw it away. Sure. Kind of thing, you know? Sure. No, that is exactly, you know, what it's come to. And I, I mean, you know, especially with the pen spinning reels, I even see, uh, I've always wanted one. There's a handful of guys that do custom work on them and they, they route them out and they port them to make them look more like Van Stalls. Because if you look at a Van Stall, right, correct me if I'm wrong, like that design, that like sort of hardcore sealed can take a beating design, that was all based on like the damn quick and the crack from way back in the day. Yep, and bailless and everything like that. I'm speaking of Bob Stahl, they moved their production over to Korea. Right. And I sold, when I first opened, I sold Bob Stahl. But I dropped them because when they moved to Korea, right, from California, mm-hmm. they didn't drop the price one penny. Right. They kept the reels. If it was a $600 reel made in, made in um, California, it was a six hundred dollar reel made in Korea, and the difference in in, in the labor costs is is ridiculous. Sure. You know what I'm saying? A, sure. a machinist in California making twenty to thirty dollars versus a an Asian machinist probably six dollars an hour or right. whatever, even less than that. Right. So that's that's you know I didn't like that whole. You know what I'm saying? You oh, know, I do. People didn't know it. Yeah, I didn't like that. I no, it's. It's very it's very understandable. I know exactly what you mean. Although I guess I would have to say that, I mean that price is part of their sort of their reputation. I mean they you know they want it to to they have to right. maintain that like you're buying the best spinning reel that money can buy. But yeah, I know there are absolutely. guys who are sticklers. As with all things, there are always guys who are sticklers for the American made ones. Like I have a Van Stall before they went overseas, and to to me, right. I mean. I could, it doesn't really make a difference, but there are a lot of guys who that's what they want. They only want the American ones. But um, I just think it's funny because they're based off of these reels. I have one sitting here that were developed decades ago, you know, with the bailless and the, the sealed system. Um, yeah. You know, and, and just to get back to those pen conventionals for one sec, like, um, you know, is there a particular year class or series of Senator or Squitter or something that, like, was more badass than well, the rest, or, or or more worth grabbing? I think, I think the well, the the reels that were made in the in the mid to late sixties, as far as spinning reels, when they came out with the SS, the skirted spool, uh-huh. and all that stuff, they really they they were the first. I mean, tried to make uh, a good spinning reel in the fifties, but all the good stuff was coming out of Germany. France and Italy, right? And then Penn came, Penn came along with their, uh, you know, their their spinning reels, and they were just, you know, they blew everybody out of the water. Then they, I mean, you still could get like uh, crack and Luxor and Alcidos and German dams and all that, right? But they were sturdy, lightweight, and easily repaired. And easily to act, obtain parts for. Right. So they pushed all the other guys out of the market. For a while, I had a friend who I used to work with who came from Ireland. And he told me that fishermen in Ireland specifically used nothing but pen. He said, because pen to them was, you know what I mean, durable. Like you were talking about senators and stuff like that. Yeah, yeah. He said, oh, yeah. He said it was huge. I mean, guys would ship home reels all the time, he said, because... Uh, 
you know, buy them real cheap here in the United States. In Europe, the, the market for pen is pretty strong, and it's still strong. Right. Like other stuff, you know, you know American-made. But nowadays, like I said, there's one company out there that owns probably, I would say, 75% of the American manufacturing names are owned by one company, Pure Fishing. Sure, sure. And they own, yeah, you know that, that yeah. they own all those all those companies and all the things that we talk about, and, you know, we reminisce about, oh, yeah, this was great, that's great, all manufactured in Asia, and it's to just stamp the name on it. That's right. all they do. Sure. I sure. try to explain that to people when they're buying stuff. They say, this box has Japanese writing on it, or this box <laughs> right. you know, it has no, no writing on it. And I say, listen, I say, this reel here is as good, if not better, than the, than the, the Fluger or the, or the Shakespeare or whatever you're trying to buy. Some of the Shakespeare and, and other brand names have no, no ball bearing drives, like two or three ball bearings. Yeah. The Asia reel's got 13 ball bearings. Right. They're as smooth as silk. Oh right. my God. Zero, zero any verse and all that. You know what I'm saying? Well, it's but that's the people are loyal to the name. That's it. Sure. Well, it's funny you bring up Fluger because Fluger, um, you know, my God, I mean, the amount of Fluger stuff you see and, and, and there's so much Fluger stuff out there that like I, I pass it up. Like I rarely buy it because to me it's like not that interesting of a find because you see it all the time. Um, mm -hmm. But, you know, like you see a lot of even the old school like low profile early Fluger bait casters and stuff out there. I mean, is there anything in that realm that's like the one to have? Well, the, the presidential series was nice. But, again, you're talking like when you're talking low profiles, not just the bait caster style. Yeah. You're buying a name. You're not buying a, a quality reel. Today, some of the reels that are like, uh, you know, 15 ball bearings and, yeah. you know, the tour tournament grade stuff. Yeah. They, they run anywhere from four to eight hundred dollars. Sure. <laughs> I mean, sure. I tell people, I say, yeah, I mean, sure. You know, you like the name, you like the looks, but it's, it's not, it's nowhere near as good as, you know. So what you're uh, saying, what like, know. so what you're saying is like, if you look at some of these old fly reels, they, they kind of match quality of what you can buy new today, but once you start getting into, you know, old school bass style bait casters, the reality is that they're they're just not as good a reel as what you can get today. So there's no benefit Absolutely. there in terms of quality. No, no. Right. For nostalgia, maybe, but not 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 even close as far as the quality of the reel. Right. You know. Right. right they're right. just coming out with stuff today. Every you know, they're just modifying it, modifying it, and they're reaching a pinnacle with it now. Who knows where they're going to go with it? Yeah. But like you said, with, with the simple. Thing that, the one of the things Von Stahl did was they went back and reached back and started manufacturing the way, like you were saying, like the Luxor, yeah. the early pen, and that's what they did. They made a sturdy, solid reel, and it's a wet gearbox thing. You, you, got, you know, the, the, you got to send it back. If you pull it apart, all the, all the oil comes out of it, right? and it's got to be sealed in by the factory. You know, if you want to, I've had them where they leak. I've actually had them where you put them on the shelf and the gearbox starts leaking on it because it's not tightened in it properly and stuff. But they they are one sturdy, simple reel. And right. it's just very, very uh it's expensive because, you know, it's made out of quality you know, C all C N C machines and aluminum. So that's another thing that makes a big difference. Yeah. Now another one that I see a ton of and um, you know, I, I always wonder because they, they tend to be very cheap. And I don't really know the entire backstory on the company, but they were a competitor of Penn is Ocean City. I mean, I see a ton of Ocean City fly, conventional, everything. Um, you know, is there is there something from the Ocean City catalog? Just because I see so much and I look at every one and I always wonder. One like, of the things that's, you know, Ocean City had some decent reels. And in the 1950s, they were the last company to manufacture Vom Hoff. Okay. They bought the rights to Bomb Hoff. And Philadelphia, they're called Philadelphia Bomb Hoffs, are pretty scarce and they're and they're decent reels. I just sold one at the uh NFL CC uh national in Lancaster here. Um they are hard to find because they were only manufactured for like a year, a year or two. Right. And uh the other Bomb Hoffs go back to the turn of the century, you know, through the they they stopped manufacturing at World War Two, 
And like I said, that the design and everything, and then somebody in the family sold to Ocean City who manufactured it for a year because they were too expensive to manufacture. Right. Too expensive to manufacture in the 50s. The other thing about, um, about the Ocean City reels is they tried to make reels at like a very inexpensive price point. Right, right. Which was part of the downfall because people were moving into better stuff. They wanted to have, you know, CNC machined, uh, like a Garwood design. Right, you know, right. You know, that kind of thing. They, they were, you know, in Ocean City, yeah, you, I mean, you know, they were, they were like five and six dollars and, you know, you could buy a, a, a Finnor wedding cake in the sixties for like a hundred, hundred and fifty dollars. Yeah. So a lot yeah. of people, they wanted, you know, there's always a person who you reach out and you want to get that expensive reel. You want to get that, you know what I mean? High end reel. Yeah. You know, play anything. You're always, you're always trying to get the next thing up. You know what I mean? You're trying to one up yourself on it. It's so crazy but, uh, to think yeah, about it. It's so crazy to think about a wedding cake being 150 bucks new back in the day because, like, oh, that, yeah. that's on my list of like someday I will have that. I did find one of the Garwood uh, Junior Finor spinning reels in a pawn shop. I in just Florida. have one. I've got a beautiful one. They are they are awesome reels. What you were just saying, the spin, the, uh, the Garwood design spinning reels are awesome reels. Okay, so and, and, so what are they worth? Before I tell you what I paid for it, it's in like perfect condition. I just Sold one. I just sold one for like a seventy-five, a number two, in the case, original, with nobody's name written on it. Okay, seventy-five, one hundred and seventy-five. Would you pay for me? I paid one hundred and twenty-five, so that's not terrible. Was it a number one or a number two? It's a num- the number two is the large. Yeah, this is a yeah, this is a number one. This is the smaller one, I think. Yeah, well, then, there you go. You paid you paid about right. And I had the original leather bag it came in too. Which adds value. Yeah, this this had no bag, but I, I was I was in a, a pawn shop in Pensacola, Florida, just killing time before the airport. And I mean, it was just like we were talking about earlier, just like cases full of junk, like just absolute junk. And like out of the corner of my eye, I did a total yeah. like, holy shit! I've only ever seen one of those in books before, and mm-hmm. I don't know, one hundred twenty five bucks didn't seem that unreasonable. So you know that no. that was did a, it have somebody's name name written on it though? Did it have a name on it? No, it's got, it's got, it just says Fenor. It does not, it's, you know, it's a number three, Mike, and it's not engraved with anybody's name. Well, that's good. You got a good, they came, to, yeah, the number one, I thought they only came in one, two sides, but eventually, I guess they made a larger one. Maybe, but, um, maybe it's yeah, the only one and it's worth price. millions. <laughs> that's a good, that's a, that's a good price. You know what I mean? You yeah. know, the thing about, the thing about that is selling through eBay, you got to add in the track if you're going to pay fees. I, I offer free shipping and stuff like that. Right. So that all that all comes on you, you know, and then they gotta pay PayPal and all that. Yeah. So you're getting you're getting pecked away pretty good. Right. I like the way I do business at the uh German trading post. It's you you buy it, you look at it, you buy it, it's the deal's done. <laughs> that's right. it, it's over. Right, right. So that's that's the way I like to do business. Well, but, I mean uh, the, yeah, the, I mean the German trading post, you've you've essentially created a a, a fully stocked tackle shop. With vintage mm-hmm. gear, which I've never been to another store like that. I mean, in my entire, the, the first time I walked yeah. through that door, I was like, "Oh my god!" Like everything I've ever wanted is uh, yeah. is in here. Um, but the one thing, you know, the one thing that you you didn't have, or maybe you didn't have it on display, like talking about things that are on my list. My one shelf reel that someday I have to own. I want a pen sixteen o senator. That's Quince reel from Jaws. And they didn't. Yep. They didn't make the sixteen very often. You can find fourteens, no. but I've had fourteens. You're right, and 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 I believe that they were certain things are custom order. I believe that wasn't something that many tackle shops kept on the shelf. Right. That if they called and said, you know, you know, I want a uh, I want a uh, a sixteen knot. They 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 made a sixteen knot. Yeah. You're right. They yeah. are they are scarce, and the guts I, I know are fair. Like like the differences between a fourteen and a sixteen are minimal, but still, like it needs to have that sixteen o nameplate, you know, on, plate on yeah. the side. And and you can go on eBay any day of the week, and they're there. But that's one for me that like I I don't want it bad enough to just slap uh, you're gonna down. Pay, you're gonna pay twelve hundred bucks for it, you know. And I, that's a real two that I would recommend you look at because it could have. Salt water corrosion. Sure, the gears could be, you know, 
Yeah, I mean, anything that, that's salt water, I like to, uh, you know, get uh, a good look at because salt water, you're, you know, just tears up real. So. Yeah, I mean, that one so for me, though, I'm never going to use that. That that That's one that yeah. would go on a shelf. But the closest I ever came was there was a... There was a random post on Craigslist, and the guy's like, I have this huge pen reel. Like, I could, I was obvious he didn't know what he had. He was cleaning out somebody's house. And I called him, and I was like, what is the number on the reel? He's like, oh, I have no idea, man, but this thing is like the size of a paint can. And I was like, dude, you got to tell me the number. There's going to be a fraction. I need the number. He's like, okay, I'll call you back. And I sat here like, please, please, please. He wanted 200 bucks for this reel. But it was, oh. it, but it was a fourteen. It was a fourteen, and I just, I, I, want, uh, I need the sixteen, you know. So, yeah, that's like, dude, you. you ever, you ever find one of them in a box somewhere? Please call me first because that's, yeah. Like, it's like, well, I definitely, uh, I've seen them. In, it, it shows years ago. I've seen them box. You know, I've seen the big Alta packs. Uh-huh. You know, they were, they, they had a, you know, the Fluger, Fluger Alta pack was, you know, it, it, they were giant reels too. That they didn't make them that big, but they made them in ten odd, yeah, nine odd. I yeah, think, you know, but uh, yeah, I've owned them, uh, the Cox, and I was, you know, I had pictures of uh, what's his name, Zane Gray, yeah, with his world records. He, he you know, he started the uh, IGFA with a couple Werner and a couple other guys, right, right. And I had a picture of him standing next to a giant um, Merlin with a Cox nine aught Cox on his rod, bamboo rod. Right. So, yeah, I mean, I had those on my shelf for years. Sure. You know, I've sure. gotten rid of them since, but... Well, I, 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 I do have to imagine, um, you know, like, what's the most popular category? Is it fly fishing? I mean, I can't imagine you see that many guys looking for vintage, big game, offshore stuff. I would say in any category in fishing, it would have to be lures. Lures, lures. are are more more... If you go to an NFL CC, we just had the national here in Lancaster last year, and the the percentage of people, and I've seen people uh, from years of collecting that have come and gone, but the, the lure collecting is something that when you get bit by that bug, believe me, right? I'm saying those guys, yeah, they go hell, you know, hell bent for you know, because it, you you just go into it so like. You know, you want to have a flying helder mite. You want to have a, you know, right, <laughs> right. You know, a Chicago minnow or something. Right. Those things are very, very expensive. And and common lures, certain people, they do not even look at them. Like I have people bringing me stuff, and I buy ninety percent of what I look at. But certain lures uh, just have no, to me, no value. I mean, you could fish them, you could, t- you know, use them as like, oh, you got a, right. you got a three to a four dollar lure for two dollars or something like yeah. that, but you know what I'm saying. The collectible lures, I'm talking glass eyes and wooden, real going back, yeah, old uh, stuff, real old, right. And then it, the, between the lures, is it even they're good? But if you get the before collectible, really before World War One, and I've only owned out of the hundreds of lures that I have right now. I would say only less than ten or pre World War One. Okay, what's the most coveted lore from that era, Mike? Like, what's the Holy Grail lore? Oh, uh, it would probably be uh, the um, I I, 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 I want to say the Chautauqua minnow, but there's another one that's uh, another minnow. I can't think of the name of it. The flying Helgamite is good, and the uh, tent frog is good, but they're the real the the real expensive ones fluctuate in price so much over the years i've seen like uh lures that i've seen sell twenty thousand, you know an up and in recent years i've seen them go for ten thousand and less right there was a moonlight moonlight was the company that was pre paw paw okay a moonlight a moonlight dreadnought which is not a very complicated lure uh it's red and white right I would say the lure itself would sell anywhere from eight hundred to twelve hundred dollars. Okay. I one mint in the box three years ago at Morphe's auction house sell for thirty two thousand dollars. Damn. Damn. Well what you know, the box is worth thirty grand. You know, that's how scarce. I have one box from that era. Right. One box. Right. I mean, and it's like people, I have the lure, and I have the lure in the box. 
Right. And they, right. They say, why is why is this one like you know, yeah, five times as expensive? I said, you don't see a box from before, especially a cardboard box. I mean, yeah. a lot of those boxes were wooden with slide top. Sure, sure. You know, you do not see boxes from that era. Very rarely. So, and it, you can look at all your friends that collect tackle. If they're selling off their collection, the last thing they'll sell is those really, really hard to find lures. Right. The ones that they'll sell the reels, they'll sell the rods. Then, but the last thing they'll sell is the. But really, because they're small, yeah, and valuable, yeah, you know, yeah. So, I yeah. mean, is it is it fair to say that the more common stuff you'll see from like the fifties, you know, through the seventies or whatever, while some of it's neat, right, it's cool stuff. There's there's really nothing from you know a little bit more modern times of lure making that's like a serious home run. You got to get old in lures for a real goes, home run, right? You got, but what I would call blue check that hold the value, ex, you know. It, hold, it has value no matter what. You see trends like there was a, you know, a trend there for the uh, for a while there. There were hot shots that were going for a lot of money, and then there was a, I forget the name of the company, Plastic. Now we're talking plastic, right? And they were selling for a lot online. But that comes and goes. You know, there's trends sure. and stuff now. Frogs are hot all the time. Everybody likes frog lures, right? But uh, you know what I'm saying, like a holic frog. I remember Holic Frogs selling for like five dollars. I can't buy one now for like under thirty. You know right, what I'm saying? Cause right. The, the, they're starting. You'll see, like, if you've been around for a long time, you'll see stuff that you fished with. The stuff that I fished yeah, with twenty five, yeah. thirty years ago is now collectible. It's yeah. now a collectible item. But you know what? To me, there's so much of it out there that you know you'll you'll run into stuff like you'll think this is excellent condition. And then you'll find one brand new, not even used. Right, right. You know? And right. Rarely, well, I, I, rarely do you find the vintage that I just told you, yeah. like World War One, unused. Yeah. That's a very, very hard to find. Well, I know, know I know a big thing in the surf scene for a while was was, was old Creek Chub Pikeys, but even those I, I rare I don't ever buy them because they're not that hard to find. I mean, there's a lot of old pikeys out there. Oh yeah. And they they've come down you're you're right about that. They'd come down a lot. There was big. I was just at the NFLCC show, and there was a guy who had a table full of them, and they were all good vintage ones. And there was a collection where somebody made, found a hoard. When you find like um, an old tackle shop that the people just put the stuff in the basement and forgot about it, yeah, that's stuff, that's the dream, that right? Yeah, yeah, that is the dream. I found one of those in, in Atlantic City years ago, but they, you know, what I'm saying that they, they're. Very rarely, you know what I'm saying, do you find older vintage hordes like that. They're all found already. Or they're still coming out there, but you got to look in places where, I'll tell you the, the horde that I found. When Atlantic City became a destination for casinos in the late 70s, right? Right, right. All the tackle shops closed. Well, I was behind Atlantic City back there in the bay, and there was a place I walked in. And it was a mom, old woman and an old man, and they had in their cases stuff that was priced from the 1970s. Wow. And it was Fenwick rods, surf rods. There was damn lures, and, I mean, damn reels, and there was treat, Creek Chub lures. Well, the Creek Chub lures, right, were in a rare sparkle mullet, which is a rare color. I sold the lures. I thought... I put them on eBay. This is like in 1999. I put them on eBay, bought them for like five bucks, expected to get 10. They were going for like 180. And a guy told me, he said, oh, this is a rare color. I had boxes up. Literally, the, 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 the box that they came in sold for like 50 bucks. Like, really? It's, it's, it's box. Oh, yeah. Sure. Well, and I, I, t I totally understand that. You know, a lot of the tackle that ends up out there, I mean, that's that's why it ends up out there, because there are those random basements of mom and pop shops that that go under. My grandparents own one, and I, man, if I could go back in time and dig through that stock room before they closed it, imagine what I would have found. Yeah. But and anyway. You, like, you're right, though. There are places to be found like that. Yeah. You know, you just got to, you know, I heard of a guy, um, Dick Clemens, who owned the, the rod place over there in um uh, Allentown told me that when he was up in the Poconos or something, walked in, same thing, mom and pop shop that went out of business. They had like 
pumpkin seed lures and all yeah. stuff, wooden, you know, all, all good hidden lures and stuff. And they had lots of it. Yeah. <laughs> you just say, I'll yeah. give you, and, and when the, the ladies, you know, eyes almost bugged out when he said, this is how much I'll give you for this whole, the whole lot of lures, yeah. you know? Well, oh, I, I think, God. I think a good lesson, Mike, considering what you do, like, you know, I think people need to understand that it's one thing to every once in a while find a cool one off, but I mean, really, the way to score the good stuff is be willing to throw down on a big lot of it at one time, right? Oh yeah. Well, that's where you get your. Uh, I, when I buy stuff, usually if I walked into your house and said, I wouldn't cherry pick it. I would go in and say, okay, this is. I'll give you this much for the whole shooting match. And that's the stuff that I don't want, and the stuff that I do want. You know, right? A lot of people do that they cherry pick it. And I even ask people when I go to look at stuff, I say, well, how many people were here before me? And I could be, oh, yeah, we had a guy coming in. I, I could usually tell right away that, yeah, the guy who came first was the guy who picked off all the good stuff. You right, know? right, so. right. Well, if anything ever happens to me, I'll tell my wife to call you. You can come over and just give her a good <laughs> price on the whole lot, man. <laughs> you got it, man. i definitely do that. Yeah. Try it. Won't pick it up. Take them like the way. Try it. Won't pick it up. So now that we're done hearing from Mike, okay, I've got kind of a confession to make, and I've, I purposely saved this to the end because I think now that you guys have heard all this, uh, this will make more sense and you'll you'll understand where I'm coming from. So, you know, in truth, the first time I ever walked into the German trading post and laid my eyes on Mike's collection of vintage tackle, it was like euphoric. It was like I had found the holy land. Right. And I popped on the international fly reel. So that was kind of like, you know, a big check off the list. And since I've gotten my hands on some other ones in some smaller sizes. But if I'm being perfectly honest, after that first visit to his store, the place kind of lost its magic because it's like now you've been there and you've found it and you know what's there so you're not stumbling upon this stuff you know I, I had mentioned that you know mike had a bunch of things there that were on my dream list one of them being um a finor ahab um fly reel that was back from when finor was still american made and not owned by zebco i always loved the old ahab series and i had never gotten my hands on one of the fly reels well it's sitting there man it's in the case Every time I'm out in Adamstown, PA, I walk in there and I look at it and I don't buy it because it's not the same. You know what I mean? And it's not like it's even terribly, it's like not unreasonably priced. And Mike would probably hook me up a little bit. But it, it's no different than, you know, needing a spool of line and walking into Dick's Sporting Goods and you know that they've got it. You know what I mean? Just walk in and grab it. And because what he essentially has there is a tackle shop just filled with really old stuff man like it's it's like it will never it'll never be your first time again you know what i'm saying like it will never be as special as your first time again uh the only perk to knowing that all that stuff exists there and knowing mike is that like if i ever I catch a wild hair and i'm hard up like for a christmas gift for myself i can actually tell my wife like Yo, uh, how much you want to spend? Okay, because I know that Mike has this thing. So just call him and tell him this these words, say this exact thing, and he'll send you that. So that's always good to have in your back pocket. But in terms of like discovering, you know, this great thing while you're out junking, man, it's just it's not the same as it was. Now that said, my greatest flea market junkin' experience of my life was in Quartzsite, Arizona. And if you know what Quartzsite, Arizona is, good for you, because that's rock star. In fact, there is a snippet of me and Tim Romano in Quartzsite, Arizona, in an old um, Bass and Carp, Arizona adventure video that's kind of a, a cult classic hook shots episode. You want to check that out on YouTube. And uh, long story short, we just happened upon Quartzsite driving between locations, and Quartzsite is essentially like um, a 300-square-mile flea market. Like, the people don't leave. Like, they just park a Winnebago there and live at their flea market site. And it was like nothing I had ever seen before. Just 
incredible square mileage of junk. And we weren't even there on a good day. We were there late in the day. So it was like a fraction of what I'm told quartzite can be on a weekend, like in the winter. And it was still the most mind-blowing flea market experience of my life. And not only was it just like a mishmash that you had to dig through, I mean, dudes would just like, you know, take a buck, five bucks for anything, you know, because the Northeast sucks for junkin'. Let me tell you, okay, there's a lot of wealthy people in the Northeast. Every stupid thing is an antique. Everybody wants top dollar. So for somebody like myself who likes junk, I live in the worst part of the country to find good junk at a reasonable price. But Quartzsite, Arizona, holy crap. In fact, if you look, uh, if you're listening to this podcast on YouTube or go to our SoundCloud page, the teaser photo that I'm, I'm using for this was actually shot by Tim Romano in Quartzsite of me looking at just a huge table full of junked up reels. And I have always dreamed of taking a vacation to Quartzsite, Arizona, just to do nothing but stay in the one crappy Motel Super 8 in what is kind of sort of a town and just spend like an entire week and see every freaking table in Quartzsite. If I could somehow spin that into a hook shots, like we did like a flea market only hook shots, I would be all over it. But the funny thing, I you know, I mentioned that that picture of me looking at reels on a table. You know, Tim's a really good photographer. He's always got his camera strapped on. He's always taking cool shots. So the 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 other big difference between the Arizona flea market and a, a Northeast flea market is that I, you know, everybody at the Arizona flea market was like a conspiracy theorist, man. And I swear like Tim busted out that there was nobody around and Tim busted out that camera and started firing pictures of the reels on this dude's table. And he, man, he came storming out of that trailer. Like, what are you You're here? What are you here with the government? You're here with eBay. And we were like, Whoa, dude, settle down, settle down, settle down. And we had to like talk this dude down because we were taking pictures of his table. Um, crazy, but oh my God, like what an amazing place. Now, if anybody listening to this has a 16 pen Senator, like squirreled away in your basement or something, I mean, I'm, I'm kind of, I kind of screwed myself because I already mentioned what they go for, but like, you know, maybe, maybe, maybe we work a little something out. Maybe I got something you want, you know what I mean? You know, we'll, we'll do a little tradesies, a little barter, you know where to find me on Facebook. And that is my Holy Grail real and uh good friends of the program uh zach the hammer miller in particular has always said well when you're ready to man up and actually do it i know the guy i don't want your guy okay i don't want your guy i want to find that 16 at a garage sale at some little old lady's house who's like oh, i don't know sonny is 20 dollars sound fair and listen everybody would be like oh jc that's so dishonest like you know you want to skip dude if 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 you try and tell me that you don't get off on those rare things like that, where you just stumble on some shit and the person has no idea what they have, you are a despicable liar. Don't even act like like you, like you would be like, oh ma'am, this is actually um, I, I'm, <laughs> for my conscience. I'm going to have to give you a thousand bucks for this bullshit. Okay, so that's how I want to find my sixteen zero pen senator. Okay, and I've actually found similar things like that on occasion, cool stuff that the person has no idea what the hell it is. And I'm even smart enough to like not jump too quickly. You know what I'm saying? Somebody's like, I don't know. Uh, how about how about twenty bucks? And you're like, oh, twenty. Yeah, here's twenty. Here's 20. I'm like, I, you always pull the like. Um. Yeah, I guess, I guess that's uh, that sounds fair. Let me think on it for a minute. That's fair. And then you decide you're going to be like an even bigger dick. And you're like, oh, I don't know. There's a little bit of paint scraped off of the bail roller. There's a little, uh, some rust on the screw heads. Uh, would you take 15? You know what I mean? Like, and, and you're, like I said, you're a liar if you don't operate that way. Like, come on. That's what you go to flea markets and garage sales for is to find the dummy with the gold that doesn't know it's gold. So if I ever end up with that 16 op pen senator by any means, which will not be eBay, I will never go that route. I will not do it. You guys will be the first to know. I will post that so hard on the Hookshots Facebook page. I might even have to make it the damn new profile picture or something like that. Anyway, for all of you flea marketers, for all of you pickers, for all of you junkers out there, 
I hope that Mike shed a little light on some things to keep an eye out for, uh, particularly if like you're like me and you actually like to fish vintage gear. I think he had some really insightful things to say about you know the, the things out there that are not crazy expensive that in a lot of cases are better made by a long shot. You know, like <laughs> there's, there's nothing wrong with, you know, if, if you spent 50 bucks on, you know, a French made Mitchell 300, okay, um, it's, it's, it's probably, it's, it's going to be a lot better real quality wise and ease of fixing wise than the $50 reel that you're going to buy at a big box store. That's just fact of the matter. Like he said, everything is made to be used and thrown away. And that's sad. And that sucks. So, hey, maybe this has even sparked the inspiration in a few of you to get behind fishing some vintage tackle. Go out there and get yourself a Pen 702 Greeny. They're not that hard to come by. Go buy an old Click and Paul fly reel just for the hell of it. I mean, come on, man. If you're trout fishing, that, that shit ain't nothing but a line holder anyway. Come on, man. Them, them trouts ain't pulling no drag. You know what I'm saying? Get out there and fish some vintage stuff. Huge thanks to Mike for helping me out with this one. I, I thought he was really great, and I was really intrigued by the stuff that he had to say. And maybe we even turned some of you into junkers. In any case, I will catch you guys right back here in two weeks. As always, thank you so much for listening to the Hook Shots podcast.